talk in the mic so they can be recorded. Otherwise, I would just go right out there with you guys. Um, thank you, Pam. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm really happy to be here to talk with you about art and activism and skill. I think Pam mentioned that I'm a member of Tectonic Beauty Project, and so I'll just give you a little bit of uh, background, or at least pose a question that is in a big in my work. Um, many of you know the work the Laramie Project, which is probably Tectonic's um, you know, thing we're, we're best known for. And in 1998, when um, Gay University of Wyoming um, student Matthew Shepard was killed, a lot of people think that we went down there to write a play about what happened. But we actually didn't go down there to write a play about what happened. We gathered together as a theater company, and Voices Kaufman, the artistic director, kind of you know, posed this question. He said, do we as theater artists have a role to play in the national dialogue about what's happening in Wyoming? And that was a really interesting question. Um, for me, it sort of was a pivotal moment in my artistic life where it was like, oh, being an artist is about the work that I'm going to make, but it's also about what is the role of the artist in society. When Matthew Shepard was killed, it was the first anti-gay hate crime that had ever made the national press. Many, many, many gay people, you know, are killed every year, and you know, it's sort of just you know, they buried, if ever, in the paper. Um, and Matthew Shepard's murder was all over CNN, MSNBC. You know, it's like this worldwide news story. And so, as a company, we said, yes, let's go to Laramie and let's talk to people. Let's see what is our role. You know, does, does the theater have a role to play in this? And we conducted a bunch of interviews and we came back and we um, eventually wrote the Laramie Project. But the process of writing the Laramie Project and also the process of writing Spill was really about listening to the people and listening to the community and letting them teach us about what the play wanted to be. And eventually we settled upon telling the story of the town because we followed the town over the course of a year and what they went through and so we wrote the Larry Project. And a lot of people think about the Larry Project as an activist work. In fact, um, often people associate us as having a certain political agenda with it and other things. Um, but really sort of the activist component of it came after the artwork existed. So what we were trying to do was make a work of art. And then what people did with the Larry Project after is where the activism piece came. And it became, you know, this play that young people do, and it's a play that's often banned. Um, high school kids try to do production, their principal won't allow them to do it, and so it becomes this kind of rallying cry for the students. Um, and it had it has become an activist tool in the hands of, of other artists who have sort of taken it and, and run with it. And in a similar way, that's what I hope. You know, will happen with Spill, but I'll talk about it. Spill is, I think, uh, a, a, a more controversial subject than, than even the murder of Matthew Shepard, so I'll talk about that a little bit um, as the talk progresses. But I wanted to start with that question of, you know, do we as artists have a role to play in these, in these moments in, 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 our, in our culture? So, as Pam mentioned, um, the proposition to co-teach a class with Barry, a science and art class, that was a no-brainer. I was like, yes, I'll do that immediately. That sounds like a really um, interesting, cool thing. And I loved working with Barry um, so much uh, and had very fond memories of, of the creative process, going through the creative process with them and saying to me every day with the students, um, what are they going to write their play? What are you going to let them go away and write their play? And I would say, they're writing it right now. And he'd say, is this messy, uh, disorganized process? Like, yes, yes, they're writing it. Trust me, trust me. Um, but I actually didn't think when I, I was obviously very affected by the BP oil spill. I think all of us can remember the spill cam on the TV, and just, you know, oil gushing, and just and no means to stop it, and just this sort of devastating reality that we had to wait, you know, upwards of three months to, for it to stop. And, but I didn't really think that I would want to make a work of art about it. Just because it seemed to me that it was like, there was something terrible, and BP was so obviously you know, at fault that maybe there wouldn't be any drama there, maybe there wouldn't be any conflict there. 
So I was like, well, I'll take the students and I'll teach them the methods. But I don't think there's a bigger work here. And then as soon as I got to Louisiana, pretty much the first afternoon there, my mind was completely changed. Um, Barry and I, he had a friend who took us out to one of the affected marshes in a boat. And I don't know if anybody in this room has spent time on the Gulf Coast. But it's this incredible, it's an incredible place. It's a magical place, really. It's a mystical place. But we went in this boat, and we were driving out to Beijing into this affected marsh. And there were literally dolphins like, jumping in the water just a few feet from the boat. And there were brown pelicans like gliding by so close to us that you felt like you could always touch them. But all around were oil rigs. And this incredible, you know, oil city basically on the water. And I was just really struck that I was in one of the most beautiful places I had ever been, but that but this this oil world just existed and it was just sort of like taken for granted. And to me, the contrast between the beauty and this really kind of omnipresent industry really was like very, that was a drama right there. How do these things coexist? Obviously they don't because they just had spill, but everybody here thinks that this is okay. So we saw the marsh and where the oil had kind of eroded away the marsh. But then on the way back, we were parking the boat in this wildlife and fisheries area. And I looked up, and there were scientists all around this table. And it became, like, it was one of those things where you'd have to, like, look at something and sort of study to try to figure out what it was. But they were um, autopsying dolphin bodies. And you could see that there were body bags of all these other dolphins, like, next to the table. And then it was just one of those moments as an artist where it was like, okay, now I'm down here in this place with Barry, and I'm seeing these dolphins being on top of and I'm getting this introduction to this place. It was just sort of a moment where I knew, like, okay, I'm going to have to look into this, I'm going to have to make something about this. Because, like, sometimes I think that the art finds us, but that was just one of those moments where it was like, I don't know, almost like a, a, a privilege or an opportunity to find myself there. I felt like I had to respond to it. I felt like I had to answer. So I came back and we made work with the students. The other thing that Barry loves Louisiana, he spent time down there doing his graduate work. And so his love of the place was really infectious. And as we got to know people down there and interview people down there, the incredible culture there that exists and the people's love of the place is so profound. So I was kind of hooked. When I came back, we talked about doing a play and and I had this image um, of Riva Wartel's paintings. She's a, a, a portrait painter. She paints these life-size portraits and I had seen an exhibit of them in Oregon a few years earlier. And I knew that I wanted to collaborate with her so I called her and I said we paint portraits of the people that we interviewed. And she said yes. So we started traveling around with certain interviewing. And then we had a play. We had a play, and we read it here. And then this is the part that I don't think you know, Pam and Aaron. I went to actually, I, I, I went to give a talk about the Larry Project in Georgia. And the people asked me what I was working on, and I said I'm making a play about the BP oil spill. And the woman put her hand up. She sort of almost like pushed it, like pushed the air in front of her. And she said, well, that's a different kind of sadness. We don't want to hear about that sadness. And I said, oh, what, well, what do you mean? It's a different kind of sadness. And she said, well, those men, you know, they, they knew what they were getting themselves into. She didn't say they deserved to die, but she basically said that we shouldn't feel compassion for them. And I was so struck by that. I was so struck by it. Okay, so who is, a, who, is a, who is a worthy victim? Who is somebody worth portraying you know, on stage? And I almost from that moment forward became, I had already spoken to some of the uh, family members who lost their, their sons on, on the way. And I became even more determined to follow that thread. So we tried to con, there was this one man, Jason Anderson, and I'll tell you a little bit about Jason. 
Jason died on the Deepwater Horizon, and Jason Anderson rewrote his will the morning when he left for his last hitch. So he was sitting in his kitchen with his wife. And he said, I feel very uneasy about operations out there. I want to go over a few things with you. And they point by point, they went through and rewrote his will. And I really wanted to talk to that family, and I had tried to talk to that family. And, and the father, we talked to the father, and he said he was just too sad. He didn't want to bring it up again. He didn't want to go over it, so he was kind of respecting his, his space. But then there was an opening where we could talk to him. So the day before first rehearsal in Baton Rouge, we drove to Texas to meet with uh, Bill Anderson, and Jason's father. And we started to hear about how frightened the rig workers were. They knew that operations were being compromised. They knew that, that things were really dangerous out there. Deep water drilling is very, very dangerous. Um, but the Maconda well, the well that blew up, was um, only, the, it was, it was, there were only three wells as complicated as that well ever drilled in the world. And they were cutting corners, and the men were very, very scared. And so we got Jason's story, and we basically rewrote the play in the first week of rehearsal. So the first act of Spill follows the rig workers as they go out to this final hitch. And one of the things that happened um, on board is the day the, the operations were very, very behind schedule. <coughs> and it's like a half a million dollar a day operation. So they were millions and millions and millions of dollars behind. And the Deepwater Horizon, the rig, they hadn't had an accident um, in seven years. So the vice presidents of the companies decided to go and give them a safety award. And they went, they arrived on the rig to give them a safety award the day that it blew up. And so they were having a they were having a, a dinner to honor the crew for safety while the well was blowing out. Those two things happened simultaneously. And I was always so like struck by that. So that's one of the things that happens in the second act, in the first act. At the end of the first act is the stories of the survivors, the all chaos broke and all the you know rehearsals and drills that they did to get off from the, uh, in the in the boats and things. That everything just went crazy, and some men were left behind, and they ended up jumping 20 stories overboard to, to save their lives. So the first act of Spill really focuses on those men, those men that, in a sense, that woman I felt really challenged me. Like, whoa, one of the things she also said was, why would you want to memorialize them? And so I really, really wanted the audience to go on that journey with those men, and what it was like to know that their lives were in danger, but they still went out there and did this job. And then the second act is the aftermath. And it starts again, like, you know, some of the things that you find out really happened are, are you know, you could never make up. But as, after the rig blew up, the next day in the um, Louisiana legislature, it was Environmental Lobby Day. And so they don't, they're in Environmental Lobby Day and the rig is on fire. They don't know it. And they invited somebody to speak for Environmental Lobby Day, who was a, was a legislature, a leg legislator who had done work with solar tax credits. So we invited him to speak. So we got to speak and he said, we did some things with solar tax credits and you know, kind of brought that up. But then he started to talk about the oil industry. And he started to talk about how the oil, how oil and nature live side by side in Louisiana. He's giving this speech about the harmonious relationship between oil and nature while the rig is on fire in the Gulf. And all of the, the environmental lawyers and lobbyists who were in the audience were like, who invited this guy? Why is he talking? Why is this is the one day we're not supposed to talk about this? Why is he talking about this? And then they started getting calls from the media saying, what's going on in the Gulf? How bad is it? What are you hearing? And that was the first time they were hearing about it. And so we follow one of those characters who was in that environmental lobby day who ended up um, basically taking scientists and being really the watchdog for, for what the media wasn't reporting. Because he was talking about, he flew out over to the source. And he talks about, he likens it to like a, a, a scene from Pearl Harbor, or World War II, where there were just drill ships and burnings and, and fire and dispersants. 
And so he was flying over in these small planes and taking people out of the watchdog from the And so he's sort of our guide through the second act and through the other people who, who were affected by the spill. So we presented the play, the new play, in, in Baton Rouge, in Louisiana. And Reva and I were you know, pretty committed to showing it there first before we, we did we have plans to take it to other places, but we were committed to sh showing it there first. And I think there was a pretty, um, I think it was a pretty strong idea that because we were from New York, that we were going to have a certain point of view toward the story and toward the oil industry. Actually, they joke a lot. They say, oh, you're from New York? Get the rope. And then they laugh. So, which is like one of those moments where it's like, what did they mean by that? Oh, never mind. Let's just move on. Uh, but there's a, an idea about New York. <laughs> New York. I know this face looks puzzled. That's how my face always looks. Um, there's an idea that we were going to have an anti-oil agenda. And the play is what the people told us. It is, it is what the people told us. To me, to me, the most profound thing about Spill is that even after all of this, very little has changed. In that even after, you know, in the second act, I think we can pretty well say that this idea that oil and nature live side by side is fractured, right? The spill is unstoppable. The spill is fractured. The, that perception, that identity of this community. But even the family members who lost their kids say we should keep drilling. We should keep drilling. We should drill to honor the man. And so the end of spill is sort of this kind of everything's going to go back to normal. Then what I try to do, and I think this is where this is where the activist piece comes in, because what I try to do at the end of Spill, is there's a speech that Tony Hayward, the BP CEO, gave to Stanford um, to Stanford uh, MBA students ten months before this bill, where he talks about um, getting the company back on track, and he, you know, he's responsible for getting the company back on track. But he talks about consumption and how much oil the world demands and the billions and billions of more people who will be on the planet in the next 20 or 30 years, how much oil they're going to demand. And so it's sort of this moment where, where I'm trying to turn the discourse back on the audience and say, well, we're all using what this company is producing. So yes, we're not personally responsible for their practices, and we're not, you know, we have no control over the, the way that this capitalist corporation runs, but everything in this room comes from petroleum products, and all of our lives go with petroleum products. And so it's just this moment of kind of like almost turning the lens at the audience to look at themselves. But thinking further about this question about Activism. I think feeling empathy for people that you don't think you have any relationship to is an, is an activist gesture. It is, I think that is a political act to invite the audience to actually find identification and empathy with people who they don't care about or never thought about before. And so that's another principle where I feel like activism is operating. And spill. I think that the Larry Project did that also in a way that you had people with you know, you know, differing views. But in spill, I think it's even more complicated because you, know, you feel really bad for these people who lost their kids. You feel really bad for these people who lost their kids. And then they turn around and say things that you really disagree with politically. Keep drilling, drill, you know, drill in my son's name, you know, things like that. So, so the holding. The com holding the complication of that character and, and trying to see things um, from different points of view. And I don't know, I just think that in this time that we live in where people pretty much hold to their view and talk to people who hold that view and interact only with people who hold that view, that there is some merit in, um, in providing stage time for people who have really, really different points of view and not to show that they're wrong, but just to show that they're different. And that hopefully, you know, we talked about a little bit about this at dinner, but hopefully it's 
it's no longer sides, but just people in a room talking and trying to think about you know, solutions for the future. So I just wanted to share a couple of a couple of texts from the play. Um, one of the stories from Act One of, of the man who, who, who jumped overboard, the man who um, was one of the people who was left behind. This is his. This is his monologue. This ends the first act of the play, or one of the last things that happens. I remember closing my eyes and saying a prayer and asking God to tell my wife and my little girl that Daddy did everything he could. And if, if I survived this, it's for a reason. I made those three steps and I pushed off the end of the rig and I fell for what seemed like forever. I went down way below the surface and when I popped back up, I felt like, okay, I've made it. But I feel this god-awful burning all over me. And I'm thinking, am I on fire? So I start doing the only thing I know to do, swim. I gotta, I gotta swim, I gotta get away from this thing. I could tell I was floating in oil and grease and diesel fuel, I mean, it's just the smell and the feel of it. And I remember looking under the rig and seeing the water on fire. And I thought, what have you done? You were dry and weren't covered in oil up there, now you've jumped and you've landed in oil. Fire's gonna come across the water and you're gonna burn up. And I thought, you just got to swim harder. So I swam and I kicked and I swam and I kicked and I swam as hard as I could until I remember not feeling any more pain. And I thought, well, I must have burned up because I don't feel anything. I don't hear anything. I don't smell anything. I must be dead. And I remember a real faint voice of, over here, over here. I thought, what in the world is that? And the next thing I know, someone grabbed my life jacket and flipped me over into this small open bow boat. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know where he'd come from. I didn't care. I was now out of the water. That was Mike Williams. I was always so struck by that, by that speech. It's so, so apocalyptic. It's one of the, the sort of climactic moments of, of the first act. And then I think I'll I think I'll show some some slides and then maybe read these other pieces along along with it because one of the first slides is of Mike Williams and I'd like to show you that slide. So these are some slides from the production and also some slides from from the portrait collection that went with it. So this is the uh, the pre-show. That little kitchen is going to be Jason's kitchen. That's Kelly Simpkins. She plays the narrator. And we constructed the set out of truss. And we had, um, in the back, you can see there's a catwalk. We had that welded. So we had these metal catwalk pieces that were on wheels and that also, that also moved around. But this is Mike Williams. So he's the guy, he's the guy who's talking about jumping overboard. And you can see now the catwalk pieces out into the, into the stage and it was turned around and it was spinning and then he finally, finally it's still at the end when he's giving that last speech. This is the arrival of the executives, the ones I was telling you about for the dinner. So one of the forms of the plays, the testimonies, people testifying, and that guy down there is talking about their arrival. And he's recounting the, the, day, the, the last day, the day of the blowout. And this is the dinner. Um, so in the back, we had the rig guys back there. And on top of the catwalk piece there is Jason Anderson. And these are the guys who are we're waiting for the safety, the safety meeting to be, you know, to happen, where they're going to honor them. 
And I don't have a good photo of it, but at the moment that the rig blows up, Jason does this slow, sorry, does this slow downstage cross. It's a very dramatic moment where we actually theatricalize the moment of his death. When things start to unravel on the rig, all the furniture starts to fly, and um, we had a projection vocabulary of, of things blowing out, so it's a highly physical um, sequence leading up to the blowout. And then this is Act 2. That's the spill cam, people talking about it. This is Joey Danos. He's a man who, um, I don't know if anybody saw the reading of Spilly prior number. He, he went out and, uh, as part of what they called the Vessels of Opportunity and cleaned up the oil. And you know, from Jory's perspective, you know, he's, he went out because they were paying people $300 a day. And he and his wife were living on $300 a month. And they were like, $300 a day, $300 a day. We can, we can put some money away, we can make some real money. How are you gonna make that kind of money? when you're sitting on a boat. And they sent them out without respirators. They sent them with very little protective gear, with no training, um, just to, to clean up, to clean up the oil that was on the water. Uh, and Jory ended up, Jory ended up having some boom that was soaked in oil, come kind of bouncing back over the boat. He, got, he basically got showered in oil. That's the story that he's recounting there. And now I'll just go from Jory being portrayed on stage to the painting of Jory. And one of the things that we did, I don't have a good photograph of it, but I do have some of the set of photographs. We, we put the portrait collection in the lobby. So when the audience came in, they saw these portraits. They could just look at them, you know, spend some time with them. And then at the intermission, we put uh, their names and quotes, so that when you came back out, you, you got to associate the words that you had just heard, and the stories that you had just heard with the people. And it was pretty profound, because by the end, by the end of the play, you really know them. And so what Reva and I really wanted to do was kind of create this space of contemplation where you could be in this kind of gallery space and spend time with the characters that you just met and spent two hours with. And it was very effective, because people didn't want to leave. I mean, usually, when, you know, if you've been to a play, people are kind of like, oh, what time is it? i got to get out of here. And the door's open, everybody runs out. So we were trying to create a space where people wouldn't want to run out. They would actually want to stay, maybe even talk to each other. This is Byron Anclay. He's another one of the paintings. He was an oyster fisherman. This is Bill Anderson. He was the father, the one who we met with in Texas. He was very, very hesitant to talk, but I think in the end he was, he was glad that he did. This is Lillian Miller. She was a, a, a roustabout. She worked on an oil rig. She's obviously retired now, but she knew a lot about what happened and was our, kind of our guide through learning about the rig world. This is Nelda YC. Nelda was the grandmother of um, Adam Weissy, who died on the rig. And she came to opening night, and she's, uh, she's in her 80s. And the first act that recounts the blowout, as I said, it's very physical, it has this dramatic video, and the sound, also the sound, is very dramatic. It's kind of like high octane, high energy act. And so Reaver and I were very nervous about Nilda because she was kind of, she's hardy, but she's still in her 80s, so we tried to prepare her. Are you sure you can see this? How's it going to go? She, no, 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 I want to see it, I want to see it. So she sat through the first act and seemed very, very, very moved by it. We checked in with her at the act, at the intermission. And then in the beginning of act two, she got up and left. And we thought, oh, we thought, we've really offended her. My God, what have, you know, what have we done? It turned out that they thought that she was having a heart attack, and they rushed her to the hospital. So at the end of opening night, Reva and I were distraught. We were like, oh my god, we've interviewed all these people. We spent all this time down here. 
now grandma, what's gonna happen to grandma? And so we rushed over to the hospital and it just, she wasn't having a, a cardiac incident, she was having a panic attack from reliving, you know, what happened to her grandson. But when we walked into the, her hospital room, you know, she was sitting in a chair, she was in her hospital gown, and she just reached out her hand and she took my hand and she was like, thank you for doing what you do. It was just one of these moments where it was like, she's in the, sorry, she's in the hospital. You know, we think we've just caused her to have a heart attack, but she's, t she's thanking us. It's like really one of those moments where an affirmation of why I do this kind of work in, in, in reaching out to people. And I think for a family like Adams, you know, most people don't even, most people remember the BP oil spill, but they don't remember that people died. And if they do remember that people died, they certainly don't remember that they had a name, that they had an identity, that they had families, that they had lives. So for them, it was very meaningful that their, that her grandson you know, was being represented on stage. And we were so relieved that we didn't kill Grandma the opening night. This is Bob B. He helped, uh, he helped bring the industry offshore. And so he's a character that we follow all the way through. Um, and one of the things that happens at the end is he reflects of, of, of he, if he has any regrets. He was one of the pioneers in, in the industry. And he actually says no. He says he doesn't have any regrets. He regrets what has become of it. But he doesn't regret the work that he did to bring it, to bring it out there. And then this is Gary. Gary is also an oyster fisherman. When the lights come back on, I'm going to read a little piece of Gary's. And this is Carrie saying, Pay. One of the things that um, the other kind of hooks into the story, it was actually a New York, uh, New York Times Magazine piece on this not too long ago, I think last week or the week before, about the, how Louisiana is losing their wetlands. And they're losing their wetlands. Uh, a football field every hour is disappearing. And a lot of this is due to, you know, the Mississippi River it doesn't function as a river anymore, but a lot of it is also due to the oil industry cutting through canals. And so Carrie um, is somebody who's an advocate for restoring the, the wetlands. This is Jory's family. And uh, Cade, when, when Riva did this portrait, Cade uh, was se severely disabled, was born with a uh, birth defect. And Kate actually died between the taking of the portrait and the opening of the play. So we gave them, you know, the, 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 a copy of this portrait of the family. And this is Jason Anderson, the one I was telling you about at Rewrote as well. And again, like I didn't have the completed installation. I didn't take any pictures, but these women who were loading the portraits into their very big lobby where the installation was going to be set up. And these are some pictures from down there. I just included a few of them at the end. These are what are, are called ghost trees. They call them that because the salt water is encroaching on, on the marsh and it kills the trees and before they die they, they turn into these almost like sculptures. And here's open water where the wetlands are eroding. And I, I don't know, I just always love this image, this beautiful place with this industry, such a dominant character down there, that juxtaposition between oil and nature. So if I could just get a little light, I did want to read, I did want to read one of Gary's pieces. This was Gary, the oyster fisherman. Some of these fishermen had 100% mortality for their oysters. This was, this was one of the the, the things that Gary said when we talked to him about it. He said, as a fisherman, you have ups and downs, your good days and your bad days, but you always know you can make a living out there on the water. 
But now we don't know what to think now because there's no future out there, no small oysters, no spats. So we don't know how long for this comeback. First time this ever happened, two seasons in a row, two seasons, no spats, no oysters, no future. These fishermen are dealing with it the best they can, I'm telling it like it is. But what are we going to do? Just hang in there. Something will happen. Something will happen sooner or later, you know. I rise every day. I rise every day. Then I'll just read one more piece. This is, um, I mentioned Adam Weissey's grandmother. This was Adam Weissey's mother, who was also a character in the play. On the one year anniversary, Transocean took us out on a helicopter to the site. On the ride, people are talking, and when the pilot said, this is it, and everybody's looking out the window, looking at it, got real quiet. I know it's silly, but I thought, Adam, rise up, rise up. I keep wondering if one day with all the hurricanes, will pieces of what they had on that rig wash ashore, whoever finds it, will they even know what it was? You know, everybody says you don't have any closure, you didn't see him in a casket. Let me tell you what, I don't think I'd ever be the same if I saw my son in a casket. That would just... Mom's still hoping. My mom still says, I keep thinking that boy's going to walk through the door. I said, Mom, it's never going to happen. It's just never going to happen. Adam is on the bottom of the gulf with the deep water horizon. Okay, good. So now, I have a few more things to say, but I think I'll open it up for questions and see if, see what you guys have on your minds. Are there any questions about the process, about anything? Yes? So does the play draw directly from It does draw directly from transcripts from interviews. It's not, a lot of people call this kind of theater verbatim theater or ethnodrama, is what I heard recently. Um, it's not verbatim. The interviews are heavily edited. And then sometimes I make up text to make bridges between their thoughts. So it's mostly drawn from their words, but it's not entirely drawn from their words. Um, in a different kind of way, there is this narrator character, um, but she's more of a theatrical device. In the Laramie Project, you know, that was one of the reasons why we were so surprised that it went on to be performed by other people because we were characters, so we thought we were the only ones who would ever do it. Um, so it's not quite the same as the company having a journey in the Laramie Project, but she is. But this narrator figure is there throughout, kind of, kind of as a guide. Because we we probably taken 15 trips by now. We actually were just back there um, last month. So we've tried to stay in touch with people. We try to stay on top of the story. Um, things are still being found out. Things are still you know shifting and changing and happening. So the bulk of the research was done um, probably within I'd say 10 months time to a year's time. But it's been ongoing conversations and and from as new information comes to light. And I think it's an interesting question about you know, where is the artist's voice inside the retelling. Uh, the artist's voice is, is, is present in every choice and every decision of what goes in and what goes out. So it's not overtly this is what the artist thinks, but the artist is continuously editing and, and you know, laying things out in the way that I want the audience to experience it. So a lot of that happens unconsciously, I think. A lot of that, a lot of that happens uh, through, through hunches and through gut instinct. Um, but it is a big question with this subject because I think in a way, um, like my aesthetic preference 
is to have the audience work a little bit, to have the audience draw connections and connected dots. But I think with the subject matter, because um, you know, 400,000 people marched in the streets, the climate march, and there's this kind of growing urgency of you know how, how, how much in peril our planet is. That it's almost like people expect the playwright to really make a very strong statement against carbon. That's been my experience. Not in Louisiana. Louisiana is the opposite. It's like, don't come here with a political agenda. But in New York, it's like almost like this sense of you have a moral obligation to make sure the audience gets it. And so, um, for me, it is that, you know, the question about art versus activism um, that I think I'm still wrestling with in some ways. Because I don't want the audience to leave thinking, well, what was she trying to say with that? But I also don't want to preach to the audience. I really want them to take away from it what they take away from it. But it's pretty controversial. Like in the end, no matter what you want it to be about, it still has to meet all the requirements of good drama. So there were there was one character in particular with the Laramie Project called Elise Harris, and she was an editor at Out Magazine. And she had done this expose after Matthew Shepard's murder of all the people who had been killed that year in hate crimes. And when she took the photographs of the victims to the art department, the guys in the art department were like, we can't print these. These people are ugly. And she was, and so she kind of went off on them like, oh, we can't print them because they're ugly. They have to be boss models for us to care about them being killed. And we all loved this, this monologue that we created from that interview. We really wanted it in the Laramie Project. But it kept feeling like it didn't belong because she wasn't from Laramie. And the whole organizing principle of the play was following the town over the course of the year. So we just kept trying to stick it in and stick it in and stick it in, and the play kept rejecting it. Just the, the drama was stopped cold as soon as she used to open her mouth. So you also do, like talking about the entry point in, you also, you know, as the playwright, have to, you know, follow the rules of good playwriting. So even if you have a, have a certain content that you want in there, it might not necessarily fly. First question, I know more about oil drilling than I ever thought I would, would ever know. Uh, I studied oil drilling for a long time and read a lot about it and tried to understand what went wrong on the rig. And I think I do understand what went wrong on the rig, but it took like months and months and months of studying and asking questions and trying to figure it out. Um, so I've changed in, in that respect. But I think my res like, this is going to be a, this is a hard question to answer because I respect the people who work on the rigs. Um, I never gave a second thought other than to think, oh, those poor people, they have to have those jobs, those dangerous jobs. Like people who work in coal mines or people who work in oil. So those poor people, they have to, that's too bad that they have to have that job. That was my view. But having met them, talked to them, talked to many of them, they love what they do. They take incredible pride in what they do. And it's very technically advanced work. You know, somebody asked me, did, did you go out on a rig? You know, in order to go out on a rig, you have to go out in a boat and get into a basket and then have a crane take you 20 stories up while you're just holding on in a basket. 
It's like, I would never do that. I would never go, I mean, I wouldn't even make it into the basket to get onto the rig. So it's like, you know, and they have these trainings where there's a place in Houston where they, uh, they put two people in a helicopter, one who can swim, one who can't, and the helicopter is attached to this giant arm, and the arm goes into a pool, and it stays down below, and they have to escape from the helicopter. And the guy who can swim has to save the guy who can't swim. And they have to do this to be recertified um, because they have a lot of helicopter crashes. They have to do it like every three years or something. And so just, you know, hearing the stories and talking to people, I just, I, I had no idea. So I, I just have a different view altogether of the industry and the people who work in it. But the bigger question about the fossil fuel industry it's a complicated question. In that Tony Hayward speech from 2009, he was telling the NBA students, as soon as Obama gets elected, we're going to have a carbon tax, and things are going to change, and as soon as America does it, the rest of the world will follow. And that never happened. And, you know, I wish that I could say that I had a hope, but I don't think that the industry is going to change course until they're really pushed to do so and it doesn't seem like they're being pushed to do so. So sometimes in the course of doing the research, I would become very depressed because I would think, well, I think they're just going to keep drilling, and fracking, and extracting oil by whatever means necessary until all of it's gone. And we all know that if we do that, that we've, you know, there goes the planet along with it. But there were definitely moments where it feels like that's the course that we're on. And I don't, you know, I don't know how to pose that in the play um, or say that it's that fatal, uh, but sometimes studying this, it can feel that way. Could you talk a little bit about moment work and, and uh, what it is and how it shaped this play to be different than it might have been if you used another approach? Yeah, moment work uh, is a technique for writing performance. So um, basically what you do is you get into a room, um, you have text, you have story, you have characters, but you get into a room and you begin to experiment with other elements. So you experiment with movement, you exper experiment with sound, you experiment with video, and see how those things um, can also inform the narrative. So it's kind of like writing a play on its feet. And so this, the staging, the theatrical event are sort of forever linked with the actual process of writing, writing the words. And actually, um, right now, um, in, in just a few weeks, I'm going to be doing more moment work on the second act because I really wasn't happy with the second act in Baton Rouge. And so most, the way most plays are written in this country is by a playwright alone in a room, only dealing with words. Just dealing with words and dealing with words and rewriting and rewriting. It, that's just not how I've been trained as a theater artist and it's just not how I think as a playwright. So in order to kind of crack the code of the questions that I have about the second act, I really want to, I need to get into the room with actors and do normal work and explore what is the theatrical form, how is this actually unfolding on stage, because that is as much about playwriting as language. I did have a different idea at first. The narrator was narrating a lot in the beginning. Um, she doesn't really narrate that much now. She's really, uh, again, like a theatrical device. So the first moment of the play is a notebook. And in the notebook um, are quotes from the people. And she begins to read the quotes from the people and kind of portray the various characters. And so it's a little bit of a nod to Anne Devier Smith. I don't know if you guys are familiar with her work, but it's the idea that all of this is all of these characters exist here in a documented form, and now we're going. She's going to portray them, and they're going to be portrayed on stage. And I think the question I still have questions about the narrator, and that's part of the reason why I'm going to do all the work with the second act. But she's been shifting and changing all along.
uh, there's resistance uh, to producing this kind of work. Those of us who try to encourage the work to happen because audiences don't necessarily want to go and spend money to see something that is, quote, to whom and do. So your efforts to humanize this story is really what I think has made it possible for this piece to thrive. But I know that it's been a struggle to get this piece produced. Could you talk a little bit about the struggles that you encountered? And I remember a moment where you said to me, I think maybe this play is going to be about my trying to get this play produced. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. That that was a huge story in and of itself. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. I think I think that uh, both humanizing the people um, and also theatricalizing a lot of it, like in, in really um, dynamic ways, um, is also sort of helping you know change people's view. I think people have a very fixed view, like oh, that's a piece about the environment, and then it just goes like silent after that. Or I don't. I actually had somebody say I'm not interested in the environment. Was you know okay? It's like well, we all breathe air, and we all you know it's kind of almost like you can't even answer it, right? Um, so yeah, it's been, it has been a struggle, but I think now that the piece is out, it's getting exposed, um, and people see that oh, it's not just about the BP oil spill; it's about these much much larger questions about where we are on, on the planet right now, where we are as a society, but where we are as a human species, really. You know, when Mike, one of the reasons I read the Mike Williams speech when he's saying, like, oh my God, I jumped and now I'm in the oil. Like, that's where we're all headed. It's, like, very apocalyptic, but that, that is, you know, where we're all headed. You know, a scientist said, in 100 years, Baton Rouge is going to be the coastline of Louisiana. And then over the course of the research, he said, change that to 50 years. So things are also, you know, speeding up very rapidly. So I think that now that the piece is out, people are watching it, um, that's helping, that's helping to shift. But it still is challenging. I mean, I had a meeting with an artistic director, I won't say the name, but he talked for 10 minutes, literally, in a monologue about how important this work was, and that this is what artists should be doing, and that it's only the artists who are going to change the world. So then there was a pause, and I said, so, you know, what about next season? And he said, well, it's such a big show. So there's this resistance to that final, final commitment. And then, you know, recently we got ourselves into the situation where um, one institution um, really thinks it should be much more political, much more political, heavy hitting political in a way, almost agitprop. But the funder who was going to enhance the production said, if it's political, we won't fund it. If it has any political agenda, we won't fund it. So one of the things that I did was, my, was my sister's idea, I can't, can't take credit, um, was to have a round table where they're going to talk to each other. That's happening in December. But there's this tension, you know, it's interesting, it's art and acting, there's this tension about the subject matter because I think it's, it's politically charged subject matter. So it's not just that it's about the environment, it's also a very politically charged subject matter. I think it makes people really uncomfortable. Not just because it's gloom and doom, but because we all have a role to play in this. However, you know, removed we are from those Greek workers and what they're doing, we all have a role to play in it. We're, none of us are like going to check the box where we want to change our lives. We're just kind of going along and waiting to see what's going to happen. Any other questions? No, that's interesting. I mean, when you do work like this, you always have in your back of your mind the people who you spoke to. That always weighs on you. Like, what will they think of it? Will they think I was fair? Will they think I was accurate? Will they think, you know, I'm making fun of them or I'm trying to prove them wrong? Or so, in a way, like that audience is always sort of like over here. But then after a point, you have to let that go. And just say, like, well, what is, what is the, what are the strongest elements of this story? Like, well, where is the drama, right? And so my audience is very broad in that respect because I just want anybody who 
is interested in good drama and good theater to be drawn into into the story, right? Um, but you know, I have some friends who always talk about where is the right wing theater? They say, where is the right wing theater? Where is the right wing theater? We're just talking to ourselves in the theater. All the people who come to the theater agree with each other, and the plays that are being represented are just giving them the ideas that they already agree with. And so I'm hoping, as we did in, in Baton Rouge, that people who aren't a traditional New York theater audience get exposed to this play. Some people who saw it there had never seen a play before in their life. They had heard us talking on the radio, and so they came to see it. So I'm hoping that it has a broad audience because I think the subject matter is an important one. Yeah. We did in Louisiana. We we um we basically did theater of Schlepp where we packed up everything and we went around to like tiny, tiny little theaters and did presentations um, down the bayou. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to work in, in Baton Rouge, um, because they did a lot of outreach in that regard. That was a very gratifying part of, of, of doing the work there, was seeing how many people came out who literally had never seen a play before and who had pretty, pretty strong um, preconceived notions that they were going to hate it they were going to hate us, um, and to have that soften and to have people really appreciate what, what we were trying to do. There are different questions for different people. Usually, when I do an interview, um, well, I'll try to get to know the person just kind of talking first, but I'll try to take them back. Like most of the interviews started with taking people back to April 20th, when the day, the day of the blowout, um, when they first heard the news, what they remember. So it's trying to take them back and kind of get them, get their memory, jar their memories so that they can start to tell you basically the story of how they were affected and what they went through. So usually when I'm doing work like this, I'll not like the very first thing that I say, but one of the first things that I say is, well, I'll, whatever the central dramatic event is, I'll bring them back to that moment. And then sort of improvise based on their answers after that. What's that? Sure, I'll take one more question. Does anybody have a question? consciously mentally prepared myself but I do I do understand that it, you know I mentioned the word privilege but it is an incredible privilege to tell other people's stories and there is a kind of you know heightened listening that goes on but I guess I'm most gratified like I'm thinking about the interview with Keith Jones and I asked him something and he paused and he said no one's ever asked me that before and then the interview kind of went a little bit deeper and I'm always sort of gratified in those moments. And also part of our interviewing process was Riva painting their portraits. And so at the end of the interview, she would say, where do you want to have your portrait painted? And that question, in some cases, people wanted to take us to, their, to the marsh, to where they played when they were children. Like we got to see a whole other side of people and of Louisiana just based on that one question. So the questions are pretty, pretty important and can lead you to you know, some pretty incredible things. I think we'll wrap up. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you for having me, Ben.